Hello and welcome to episode 113 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings, and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And on this episode, my guest is Joanne Ruocco, a drummer and percussionist who has played with the likes of Bobby Womack, Chuck Berry, Ronnie Wood, and the Star Council. Yes, I know, a drummer in the Star Council who isn't Steve White. Well, Joe played with the band around the period of Confessions of a Pop Group. So let's get into it. Joe Ruocco, thanks for joining me. And thank you for inviting me. Well, I don't know whether I should call you Joe or Little Joe, because that's what the Star Council knew you as, right? That's right, Little Joe. And in the uh, credits, they put me down as Little Joe, because at the time I thought I was little and Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mentioned to Mick Talbot the other day that you were coming. He was like, oh, little Joe. <laughs> Which is lovely. Hey, look, I want to take you right back to the beginning of this entire journey for you as a musician and a kid with a love of drums growing up in New Jersey. Let's take take it back there. I mean, how old were you when you first picked up the sticks? I was four years old. Four. And, yeah, four <laughs> years old. And it just was natural. I, my, my parents listened to all different kinds of music. That was the advantage of growing up and hearing all this from jazz to Motown to even rock, whatever. Picked up a pair of sticks and would start playing on pillows naturally because I really would like to do this. So one trip, my mother went to Haiti on business. One of the drum doctors, I want to call, they made a drum, wooden drum, all hand carved and had goat skin on it. Tell your daughter to play this drum. She's meant to play the drums. So I started playing it naturally and it just happened from there. By the age of 10, I had my drum kit. And I think by the age of 13, I was doing my first showcase with Mercer Ellington and Ellis Fitzgerald came out and was the guest singer. What an experience. I mean, my God, that's incredible. Self-taught, mainly. All by ear, all by feel and ear. And then, of course, later on, you go and learn your chops and learn technique and stuff like that. But your mum was in PR, was that right? So we're in this kind of world of showbiz, if you like. Yeah, she was into this PR world. I remember... She would have a lot of parties back at the house, so to speak. And at the time, she was doing these fashion shows, high profile fashion shows. To make a long story short, she had Mary Kwan in her show, and Mary Kwan came to her house. I remember we opened the front door, and there she was in her mini skirt. You know, people like that, Woody Allen, things like that. You know, it was nutty. It was nutty. <laughs> Charismatic, but not like your average mom, where, you know, she's going to the PTA meetings and, you know, so there's ups and downs. It was nutty. Okay. That's one of the great ways of describing it. Uh, she would say beautiful confusion, and it certainly was. So you mentioned like the first gig was with Duke Ellington's band then. This was after Duke had passed, right? That's right. So again, once again, through my mother, she was doing a big fundraiser for cancer research. And this was out in Hampton. So make a long story short, they were playing. And I should say, actually, this is, this is post Sonny Greer on drums. Rocky White is the drummer at this point. And what happens then? When he stopped, he goes, what? I go, I can do what you can do. I can do what you can do. Can I get up and play? Can I get up and play? Finally, he says, all right, come on. So I went up and they just went into the song Satin Dial. So I played that and they turned around. So it was me. It was like, whoa, you've got to do a little solo. So I did a little solo and it was magic. Later on, I got a call out of the blue for to work with Chuck Berry at Hunter College was the first show. And that was the night before I was meant to go for my SATs and study. What do we do? She turned around on the kitchen phone. What do we do? Do you want to, you have your SATs? I said, do you even have to ask? <laughs> it's Chuck <laughs> Berry. Let's go. Let's go. That's my calling. Let's go. So what are you, 16? I was 16. Went in and met him. He was, uh, what can I say? He was, you know, he was just what you imagine, you know, off the wall. But then he was a gentleman. We went on the stage and he had me in the front. So it was him and I playing in the front and them were in the back. We just kept playing. And then it got to the point where it was the end and we were doing Encore, Johnny Be Good. People would just go up on the stage, pull all around us. And he comes after we're done. I went to shake his hand and he went to shake my hand. It was a great shot. I have it. And he says, a star is born. And I just never forgot that. So whenever he was in town in New York area, that vicinity, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, I would be asked to go in because I was 16. That wasn't like I could go on the road. I, well, trust me, I, if my parents were, weren't so conscientious that you got to finish school, I would have. 
There's no doubt about it. I want to get, <laughs> that to me was cool. It feels like you're quite impulsive uh, in that way and kind of following the dream and going where you want to go. And because you then you pack up and leave and then come to England with no real yeah. plans, right? Well, this is the thing, like what drew me to come over. I loved what was going on over like during the punk and then especially the post punk. And then, of course, you had the jam and yet all this stuff happening here in England. It was just popping out really quick, fast and furious. And every, it seemed like every week, five more singles would come out from all different bands. It was like, oh, my God, it's so alive there. There's nothing happening here. You know, it just, we were stuck in the rock. It was no problem. I love rock. But at the time, so it was like, I want to go. And this turned out my sister's friend, um, who lives in London, says, anytime Joanne wants to come over, she can come over. So it was just after college. And I said, I'm going to take that offer. So I went over to visit Wendy. My first vision of coming over to England was like, I'm here. This is so cool. The streets are so narrow. I was so intrigued. One morning I got up really early and I saw two police officers, Bobby's, and they had the the old fashioned Bobby hats. So I invited him back to my friend's place, to her flat. (laughs) I thought I'd be coming to have coffee and take a picture. And they came back and took, I think my friend almost dropped dead. What are you doing? We don't do that over here. You just don't invite police to come over they only come over for one reason and that's not the reason but yeah nutty and then it was like also then the carnival it was around the time when we had carnival in august so it was like this big festivity around portobello road and i just was so getting acquainted to the drink over here the beer and it, i think it was tenants it was really super strong and i remember I drank quite a few of those i was so drunk i don't remember i left the place and i realized i didn't have keys to get back in her flat so I climbed the drain pipe and got in through the window. And then I realized, I want to make a go here. So I said, how's the best way to learn my way around? She goes, go on a train and get lost. I said, okay, I'll do that. Get on the train and get lost. So I went on the train, got lost, tried to find my way around, walk around all the streets, learn all the train lines. And it was the best way to do it. So I picked up back then Melody Maker. And they used to advertise bands looking for drummers or musicians needing other musicians. So I found a couple bands and I figured I'd call up on it. One was um, Buster Cherry Jones. And he sometimes would fill in and play bass for Talking Heads. What happened? All three bands decided to book at the same studio, showcase studio. Back then it was John Henry's. They were on Caledonian Road. I think John Henry's is still going, believe it or not. Studio 5 was the showcase room, you know, the stage, the lighting. So I'd go in. Play with bands, you know, you had your Polydor, you had your Wea, you had your EMI, Chrysalis, you know, et cetera. Finally, this one AR guy came up from Warner Brothers and he said, Joe, which band are you in? I've seen you today now with five bands. I said, the one that gets signed, that's the one I'm in. <laughs> Good answer. And with that, we exchanged numbers. He says, I have something I think you might be interested to work with an artist. At the time, his name was Mark Rogers, band called Hollywood Beyond. You remember them? I do. What's yeah, yeah. The color of money? What's the color of money? Well, that one. I got in and played. And then he was like, right, we need to go and do all these shows. I was like, okay. I was like, what, 26, 27? And we were playing really cool clubs like the Heaven Club and the Royal College of Art. We were really funky rhythms. The drums were really funky. It's kind of like that funk with a little bit of John Bonham on there. Horn section and a bass. Very obscure stuff, but it was really, really good. And from that, I got spotted by the Paul Weller crowd. So I came home one day. I moved out of my friend's place and I was living in a place with my boyfriend at the time, which I ended up getting married to. It was a phone message on the answering machine. I played it back, you know, and it played it back. It was like, oh, excuse me. I don't do a great uh, Paul Weller accent. I'll try. Oh, this is Paul. Yeah, uh, Paul Weller. I'm doing this album right now, and I don't have a drummer, and I need a drummer and percussion. And I thought, well, he's got a drummer. He's got Steve White. I, have a, I need a drummer. I don't have a drummer now, and I have to finish off this album. Can you do that? I heard you and I really liked you to finish the album with me, come down to Solid Bond. So I had to play that back so many times because I was like, is this a nutter or is this for real? <laughs> I got the message on the answering machine. I had to play it like multiple times because I, you know, I thought, is this for real? Am I really hearing what I thought? Because I looked up to Paul so much growing up. Um, why well, I say growing up? Because I'm 
too much older than me. So, but I really loved the jam and everything he did about it, what he meant. So to get that phone call, I was like, I had to just pinch myself, or is this a nutter? <laughs> so I remember playing it back and, and then finally I got the nerve. I said, I got to call him back. When do I call him back now? Or do I call him back on Monday? So I called him on Monday. So I called him at 11 o'clock and it was him. It was at Solid Bond Studios. He says, yeah, that was me. I said, I'm really sorry I was delayed, but I didn't know if it was another or if it really was you. He laughed. He says, come on down. When can you come down? I says, I can come down whenever you want. Let's do it. So I went down and I remember walking into Solid Bond and remembering in the room, he had all his gold discs and platinum disc jam and style council. And I was just looking at it and he goes, um, I go, wow, this is great. You know, what you've achieved with uh, the jam. And then he goes, um, yeah. Uh, excuse my French. He goes, yeah, well, that was shit. This is better. <laughs> and then he goes, are oh, you cheap? I go, no, my name's Joanne. <laughs> he says, all right, I got asked to finish off the album. And then from there, go on to, to promote it. So I go in, I start, I, I think the first track we did was Confessions of a Pop Group. So this is off the back of Red Wedge. He's kind of moved away from the political and maybe the soul influences. And he's kind of immersed himself really in things like Debussy and the Swingle Sisters and the modern jazz quartet, yeah, yeah. stuff like that, right? But he still had flaring in his lyrics, like, for example, Life at a Top People's Health Farm. Back then, he had so much change. It was, that's what I thought was so exciting here, being here in the UK, mm-hmm. because you had the post punk the new romantics, been and gone, and you have the style council now with the soul, funk, pop, and you had fringes of rock in other bands. And it was like mixed bag. It was really, you had to be here. And fashion was changing like this because the Style Council was all about image and, um, and, and sound. And, and we're very conscious about image. So when we did live stuff, we moved television, very conscientious of how we appeared and the way to dress, you know. Anyway, make a long story short. So with Life at a Top People's Health Farm, he mentions about the changes that are going on in the country, you know. It was during the Thatcher years when you would hear about who, who's in, who's out, who's left. It was also about young people getting up on the ladder. I guess he called it the yuppie era, the beginning of that. But it meant a lot to be around and see this. It means a lot to me and to be here. Uh, it was just so cool. I have to admit, when I met Paul, he was so cool, dress looking, suave. I have to admit, I had a crush on him. <laughs> I never told him that, but I did. I just thought he was so cool and collective, and you know the way he put himself together. Mick Talbot as well, brilliant keyboardist. And the, between the two masterminds, I call them, it was so much fun to be in the studio. So getting back, when we did Confessions of a Pop Group, I remember going in the drum booth and overdubbing, adding the bits that need to be added. The actual bass drum and snare was programmed by Paul, but I added other bits to it on a kit and added fills on cymbals and getting it more of a groove to work with that. And I looked in the control room and I see Paul and Mick dancing, like going crazy. And I said, is that all right? Yeah, keep going, keep going. So then when we're done with the drum bits, then I went over to the percussion. I said, now I want to layer it. What do you want to do? I said, let's start off with the kunga drum. So I put some kungas in there. And from there, then put the bongos on top. So do a little bit of soloing on the bongos where there's a part where it gets soloed. Put cowbell in there. And when you hear it played back, they were like, yeah, come in here. It was magic. It was fun. That's how it started. And we did that pretty quick. I mean, I told you the truth. We did it in like less than an hour. That was done and dusted. And then we continued on other tracks, how she threw it all away and stuff like that. But I just remembered also the canteen there at Solid Bon. I loved going down the canteen lunch break because Paul is a vegetarian, as you may know. They made the most awesome cheese melt sandwiches I, to this day, I remember. And they had the, those old fashioned yearns that with the hot water. And I forget the guy that worked in the canteen, but he was an old boy. And I love them to bits. And he always make the perfect tea, you know. Us, you know, in America, we would put a tea bag in a cup with hot water and put it in the microwave. That's not how you make it. I just remember that. And I remember hanging out in the canteen. We would all talk and have lots of giggles. And there's a really funny side to both of them, Mick and Paul. I remember we did a TV show and was out in Maidstone. At 7 o'clock, we had to be on the show. That's freaking early. But... You know, the night before, we're all, we met up at the hotel. We're all having a giggle. We're having a good time. Before we went to bed, 
it was full sister Nikki. She was really lovely. Got on really well with them. And we would play a game where we'd go around and everybody back then used to put their shoes out to get polished. You know, these posh hotels, they put them out to get polished. So we thought it'd be funny to mix everybody's shoes up. So when we got up really early for this call, which is virtually we had very little sleep, you can imagine, we hear all the fussel and the fuss and people going crazy. And we just, it was a nice way to start the day with a laugh, you know? By the time we got to Motor Mouth Show, it was no problem. <laughs> That's brilliant. Cool. I love that. So let's talk about that album as well, because it was it was Soul Council's first studio album in a year and a half. And I think Paul was probably talking, I mean, it's a brilliant album. It's a stunning album. And I think now people are talking about that. And so many people talk about that as being one of their favorite Style Council albums. But at the time, it you know, it didn't enter the top 10. I think it was in the top 100 for a few weeks and then gone. It did really well in Japan. It went platinum in Japan. They, they love it over in Japan. They love the Style Council out there. But it was kind of, I guess it was the beginning of the end of the band in the sense that, you know, the next album that was recorded, Modernism, didn't get released at the time. Mix talks about the fact, I think he had had a child at that time. Dee was pregnant. They had, you know, had Matt. So you know, their first firstborn soon afterwards, yeah. and maybe they were losing interest in the band, or, or the audience were losing interest in the band as well, perhaps at that time. But actually, that material is stunning, and there's some great tracks on that album. It's, it's really strong. I'll tell you what. Did you ever see the Pinewood version, the videos, promotional videos? We had a, we were there for 15 hours. We had to record five tracks. Sounds like not much, but it was a lot. And had the London Philharmonic Orchestra there, so that was a real honor to be on stage with them. The thing about that TV performance or their recording and and it is available on like the, the dvd the style council um, dvd box set the premiere of it was after match of the day on saturday night that was the first showing of it which just seems yeah. such a random thing <laughs> like so i know because I it wasn't like they were a blokey blokey band and the the, the football fans are going to stay tuned for the style council afterwards it was just a really bizarre thing <laughs> let's talk one two three four so this was um an ep and actually the advertising at the time for it said this is the record you've been asking for a special ep rush release for one wonderful titles, 7-inch, 12-inch CD single. And you have How She Threw It All Away, which you played on, but we also have Love for the First Time, which you yes, played percussion on. on. And this brilliant drum solo on I Do Like to Be Beside the A-Side. Aww. Talk me through the making of that then. Was it around the same time in terms of the sessions? That was the funky keyboards that Mick was doing. So I just picked up on that. And on the percussion, Kungas and the bongos, I elaborated on that with the keys and with what Paul was doing on his guitar. That was fun. It was an instrumental. I think that one really, really rocks. I think doing that live would have been, would be cool. You never played live with the band as in live on tour because they weren't really touring so much around then, were they? We did some shows in Italy, promotional shows. We were in Milan at the time. It was a big music fest and we went there. And I, I remember a um, funny thing where I was in the car with Paul and there was all these people, Italians, seeing the car with Paul Weller. And they were like, Paul, Paul, Paul. And he goes, I bet these are all your relatives. you know. Uh, uh. But it was funny. And we did lots of promotional work, TV shows. We were meant to go on a world tour. And the kickoff of the tour was to promote Confessions of a Pop Group, okay? And, of course, other stuff of the Style Council. Mick got unwell, so the tour was pulled. We were meant to go to Japan first, kick off in Japan, and then from Japan work our way over to the U.S., and we were booked at Radio City Music Hall. And that, to me, I was like, wow, being playing back with this really cool pop band in my homeland. I just thought that would be very cool. But, you know, it happened what it happened. That was then. I'm a firm believer things happen for a reason. It's not necessarily a negative, but I really think it would be really cool. Paul, if you're listening to this, and Mick, this is Jojo. <laughs> Little Joe, let's get together. Um, <laughs> stop being shy. And let's make it happen. The one thing about the Style Council as well, I mean, they were a singles band. The singles that they released were stunning. So oh, many yeah. singles, not yeah. on albums, all that. But also yeah. the amount of B-sides, I mean, very similar to the jam, the amount of B-sides. And Love the First Time, you go, why is that not on an album? That's a terrific song, right? It's a beautiful song. In fact, that's one of my Desert Island picks. That song I thought was beautiful. And yeah, I did play on that. It was, you know, I mean, the little wind jive. It was so pretty when he was in the studio playing it on the guitar. That's one thing Paul did when it was time to lay guitar tracks like Confessions of a Pop Group, his solo bit. He liked to do it privately. So everybody was out of the control room. I mean, the rhythm guitar he do, would do with us when we were out and he was back in the evening, he'd be on his own or maybe with Mick. He would do his parts quietly. 
on the guitar. Very interesting. I dig it. I get it. And it does feel like it's an album that's much more, certainly that first side, much more out of his comfort zone in terms of those classical influences. Maybe not so much the jazz, but the classical influences was, was new to the style council on, on the first side. The track, Changing of the Guard, beautiful. And like in the video, you see the uh, London Philharmonic Art Orchestra with the draping curtains blowing, flowing. And it was such a pretty and tall and D.C. Lee was heavily pregnant at the time. We had an ambulance on call at stage. Any minute she was going to drop the baby, literally. I still say I was so lucky to have to have been asked to come on board. I'm very grateful for that. I mentioned him being a singles band. Singular Adventures was the final album that we had during the lifespan of the band being a band before Polydor rejected that final album. And the cover version of Promised Land was the lead single from it. And you were with the band for the PR of that single, right? Well, there was a drum machine, but what we did do, we did a lot on the promo tracks. I did the visual exactly playing to the drum machine on Promised Land. Top of the Pops in Italy. I got to tell you another thing. Well, it's just coming to my head. Another fun moment was being in the car with Mick and Paul. We were on our way to go to Portobello Road. And in there, we were going to record to Life at a Top People's Health Farm. So across the pub, you had the horn section playing out the window at that pub. And we were on the rooftop opposite of a cafe. So it was the Mick on Keys, Myself on the drums, Ruth on bass, Lady Ruth. We had DC Lee with us, and of course Paul. And across the way is the horn section, three horns, trombone, trumpet, another one. And there was, it was hilarious. It was a lot of fun. I remember that. And that was for broadcasted for what you call Top of the Pops in Japan. And then they had the Japanese people interview Paul and Mick. And they go, what would you do if you were... In, if you didn't make it, you know, in, in the style council. And I think Paul said, I drive the buses. I've, <laughs> I've seen that footage. I've seen that clip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Classic. Yes, it was so funny. But that's what I'm saying. They were very impish kind of personality fun. It was fun. When you see Paul in his, like, in his songs, you think there's a, he's very serious. He's very dramatic coming out with you, whether it's anger or emotional. But off of that, he's a pretty down-to-earth guy. Very quiet, very... He can be insular too, but he's a true Gemini. He loves loves people. Obviously, the band comes to an end fairly soon after because that record, that that modernism album, gets rejected by Polydor and doesn't get released. But that's not the end of your career. I mean, you go on to play with people like Billy Ocean, Ronnie Wood, Kylie, Bobby Womack at Glastonbury. Is that right? That's right. And the funny thing is, Paul ended up doing a show. I went to it. He was playing with Ronnie Woods. Can't remember. It was at the Royal Albert Hall. But Bobby was there because Bobby was on his last legs. Bobby, unfortunately, was on very unwell. And um, he was dying. And he did that concert. It was basically to help his family when he passes. But Paul was there on the stage. And it was nice to see Paul, Ronnie together and Bobby coming out. It was just a, it was a really good concert. And to be there. That was a brilliant concert. And how did the connection, how did you get to play with him and join his band? And and what was it like playing Glastonbury on that big stage then? Well, with Bobby Womack, how I got that, it was a friend of mine who was a session drummer for at the time for Bobby Womack. This is going back, 80, I like to say, 88, around there. And um, he was double booked. He was playing with another artist and he had to be on top of the pops and he couldn't do this gig. So he said, could you go down? It was at um, Noma Studios down in uh, Olympia. It was recorded there, yeah. It was to go down there. I remember walking in and he, go, and he goes, he introduced me to Bobby real quickly. And he says, little Joe is going to fill in. Oh, hello, little Joe. So I get on the kit. We hit it off. It felt great. And the guy on the bass, they had a great setup. The guy on the bass, this guy, Guy Pratt, went on to play with Pink Floyd. You can imagine, Guy is a fantastic bass player. I don't need to speak for Guy. But between him, we, we really locked in. And with Bobby's music, it just really felt like connected. Just simple grooves. You know, it's not what notes you play. It's the notes you don't play. I count kind of thing. We had such a good time. And then my friend, Trevor, I won't mention his full name. I didn't want him to get upset or anything. Only good things, Trevor. Only good things. Anyway, he came back to say, okay, thanks a lot, Joe. I'm going to finish off. And Bobby goes, wait, 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 wait. what's going on here? I go, I'm done. Trevor's back. He goes, no, you stay on that kit. I'm like, uh-uh. So then he goes to Trevor. He goes, she's staying here. That woman has got more rhythm in her whole body than you have in your little pinky. So you're out, she's in, and you don't go anywhere, little Joe. All right, 
times did not want to be in that position because it was really awkward. All I could think about, oh my God, how would I feel if I was Trevor? I'd feel terrible, right? So I remember I ran out and he says, no, it's all right. Leave it. Just leave it. Finish you off what you got to do. So I went back and that's how that started. The connection always started. So we kept in contact and lost touch and then reconnected when I heard he was going to be at Glastonbury. So I hooked up with his management and Bobby and I reconnected with Bobby then and there. So it was a massive setup. It was a quick run um, because he was really unwell. That was around the time when he did the album with Damon Albarn then, wasn't it? The, was That's it the, right. Yeah, Bravest Man in the Universe, was it? Yeah, that was wonderful. That was that a was great, cool. great album. Yeah, terrific. Love that. Hey, look, this has been so lovely. Um, I've got two final questions for you, Joe, before you go. So you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be The Jam, The Style Council, or Solo. What are you going to go with? Oh, God. This is tough. Really, you know, I, I was thinking about that. I was like, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? Um, I like how she threw it all away. Not because I played on it, but it's a really poppy song. And I like the words in it because I think I know why, where that song was written by. But I'm not going to say it. Paul knows. But I think that I would keep because I think I know what it's about. And the, I guess the other one would be It's a Very Deep Sea. It's a beautiful song. And Paul's been playing that in his set list recently, the, the summer gigs. He's, he's got that. That's back in the set list. Well, you mentioned you ran into Mick. Talbot. When you see Mick, just tell him I said hi. And when you see Paul, tell him, hey, let's get to all get together. Because it'd be great for you to finally do a proper interview with Paul and Mick. That'd be great. I definitely would listen in. In fact, I would call in and say, you didn't say that. No. <laughs> well, that is the ambition of this podcast. So yes, it's to talk to lovely people like yourself who've got these connections with Paul, these amazing careers to dig into and stories and stuff. It's for me to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. If it happens, if we get the interview with Paul, what should I ask him? Joe, what do you reckon? Paul, would you consider getting together? It's been a lot of water under the bridge and time has passed with little Joe doing drums, percussion. Carmel Hines on bass. Let's get Mick on keys. You can have Steve Guess on there as well. Two drummers is cool. Some horns. Let's make it happen. I think it would be great. And even do some of your own personal material because I can really rock it. That'd be really wonderful to do that. I'd be so, uh, it'd be great. Joe, thank you so much for your time. I've loved speaking to you. Cheers for joining us on the podcast. I'd like to thank you, Dan. And I'd like to say, I have my deepest sympathy to everybody in England. I'm really sorry for what happened with Queen passing is a very sad time. And I just want to say we should just take this time to just consider all the sacrifices she's done to put everybody first besides herself. And that was mainly her country, just to make an example. So I'm not, believe me, I'm not pro monarchy or pro politician. I'm just about her values. That really hit home. I'm sure it's hitting everybody. God bless. Well, my thanks to little Joe for joining me on the podcast. Lovely to find another piece of our Style Council jigsaw puzzle of honorary councillors to add into the big picture. Here's hoping for more in the future. You can check out the show notes for this podcast on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. And whilst you're there, do check out my store for exclusive podcast merchandise. The nights are drawing in and an official podcast sweatshirt would look lovely on you. Trust me on that one. That's just one way to show your support. You can also buy a virtual coffee as well. Doing it this week. Duncan, hello to you. Brian, Rob, aka Plod the Mod, who says he's been a Weller fan since Wolverhampton Civic on the 3rd of the 12th, 1977. Had a bit of time out, but back listening to the genius songwriter of my youth. Great podcast. Keep up the good work. The highlight of my week when a new podcast drops. Cheers, pal. Thanks for that. Cheers to those of you who have left a review as well. Critical listening for any Weller fan. Some stories you will have heard, but most you won't. And for any Weller fan, it's must listening. Dan's a great host and his enthusiasm enhances each podcast. Hope you get that interview, Dan. You deserve it. Well, bless you, my friend. This one from Ted Rock 15 says, Stunning, a truly fantastic podcast. I'm addicted already. Host instantly impresses his guests with his knowledge and has their utmost respect because of it. Top marks all round. Well, how lovely is that one? And Vinny Bick says, every one of these podcasts has something new in them. The guests always have great stories or tidbits for the listener. And Dan, the host, is very knowledgeable and obviously enthusiastic about his subject. Keep it going, Dan. I'm sure it won't be long before you speak to the governor himself. Well, cheers, Vinny. Fingers crossed. Don't forget, head to my website. You can grab a virtual coffee for a shout out next week. It's much appreciated. Now, in the next episode of this podcast, we hear from a singer, songwriter and activist who has entertained and educated us for around 40 years. 
We're talking to have and to have not, the milkman of human kindness, a New England, Levi Stubbs tears, sexuality, you woke up my neighborhood, too many great songs to mention. Yes, the magnificent Billy Bragg joins me on the next episode of this podcast. Make sure you follow, subscribe wherever you get yours. You'll find me on social media as well. Get in touch on Twitter at Weller Fan Pod or on Instagram and Facebook. Just search for Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.